everyone, Larry Randolph here again with Heart Talk. Hey, today I want to say something to you that I think is unsayable. Um, it's unsayable because uh, I, I'm going to talk from my heart, so I'm probably going to stumble through some things um, uh, because it is difficult to say uh, what's in your heart as opposed to what's in your head. And um, I believe I have a good example for that, and that would be the Apostle Paul. And uh, we find in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, 7, he, uh, dealing with the same issue of having a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, with the people of God. And uh, he, unlike me, was a brilliant theologian, and uh, he was an amazing cornerstone of New Testament theology. He was uh, uh, a lawyer. He was a, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was in the Sanhedrin. He was just like, what an amazing, his prowess, his intellectual prowess was uh, without measure. And although this great theologian had the capacity to speak from his head, which he did, and set the, uh, set the pace for New Testament theology, he said in his, uh, to the Corinthian church something from his heart that was really gripping. And this is how he said it. I, brethren, when I came to you, speaking to the church that was planted in Corinth, I did not come with the ecstasy of my own speech or my own wisdom to declare unto you the testimony of God. And I was with you in great weakness. Wow. And in fear and in much trembling. This is a man of great strength. But now he's speaking from his heart and says, my speech and my preaching, uh, I didn't lean into persuasive words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the spirit and the power of God. Why? That your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men or the wisdom of intellect, but in God. For I speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, and he calls it the hidden wisdom, which means things that are hidden are hard to be revealed through the human tongue or through intellect. Hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages. He said, again, I speak the wisdom of God, which is a mystery because it is hidden wisdom that God ordained before the ages. And then he puts in this caveat in the very end that it this gripping, he says, for our glory. In other words, God has chosen to reveal himself through the heart of man and hidden wisdom that's unexplainable, inexplicable, actually. And he's done that for our very glory. And so that was what I think Paul was saying. He was saying, I'm trying to say the unsayable gospel because it's a heart gospel and not a head gospel. And unfortunately, the church has turned it into intellectual uh, uh, theology, which is nothing wrong with that, other than it's hard to convey, convey or to capture God with intellect and with mere theology. So I will give you my language, my simple language of what I think Paul was saying. This is what he was saying to me through the scripture. And this is what I get through that is this. The closer I get to heaven, the more I realize how far away my heart is from heaven. Because a lot of who I am and a lot of who we are is pretty much built upon the intellect, the teachings, what we've learned, principles and, and uh, our ministries and uh, our connections and uh, and the religious world and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that is wonderful, all that is good. But I think that our intellect and our ministries have ran ahead of our hearts. And I think that our hearts are, are, are running fast to stay up with our ministries. And so likewise, I also understand the wonder and the greatness of God. And when I see the wonder and the greatness and I see the awe of God, the smaller I feel and the less I seem to have to say. As a matter of fact, when I was preparing this morning for this, I thought this is crazy, it's like this paradoxical, this is a paradoxical reality that the more I understand nearly at 70 years old about God, a lifetime of chasing, running for God, the more I understand about him, the less I really know. And not only the less I really know, the less I really have to say. As a matter of fact, I have lost the whole feel of ambition, the whole feel of, uh, feel of trying to say something because I've said it so many times with my head and not with my heart that I feel like my heart is in the shadows of my intellect and I'm trying to fix that uh, in my lifetime. So what does that mean? What is this paradox of reality to you? Uh, what is it to me? Wh what was Paul saying? What am I trying to say to you? If I've not said it the right way, I'm gonna say it this way. Maybe this will help. God is not anxious or in a panic to reveal himself to creation. Somehow we think that God is working day and night to try to, how do I get through? How do I reveal myself? He's not in some kind of great revealing uh, mode where that he feels like everybody has to know who he is and everything about him. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. He has taken extreme measures. God has taken extreme measures to hide himself from the uh, pandering of casual seekers. In other words, God and all that he is and all of his wonder and his greatness has no need to reveal himself. 
He is, and He is that He is. He said, I am that I am. And only those who seek and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking, according to scriptures, are those that find Him. He is parsing through and setting aside casual believers and he's not, he's only giving them the theological side or perhaps the religious side of who he is. And those are a piece of who God is, but he's not become a heart or he's not had a heart connect with them. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about the hidden mystery of God, the hiddenness of God and the hidden wisdom of, of God and the creative genius of this hidden uh, wisdom of God. And to do that, I have to begin with the beginning of God hiding himself because God has always been there. He always was from the beginning of time before there was a beginning, there was God, but there was no cosmos. There was no world. There was no, uh, atomic, uh, uh, atom, uh, uh you know, uh, arena of, 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 uh, cells and, and, uh, workable pieces of DNA. There was none of that at all. There was just God and the household of God, wherever that was and all that God has with him and the host of heaven with him. There was not that there was no Adam. There was no Eve. There was no me. There was no you. So when God decided to reveal himself, he revealed himself by hiding himself. I know that sounds paradoxical and counterintuitive, but God reveals himself by hiding himself. You find God in the hiddenness of God because God hides himself in plain sight and humans don't get plain sight. We don't get that because we're always looking for the mystery, the deep stuff. I mean, we're so deep even God doesn't understand us sometimes. I mean, we think it's about being deep when it's really about simply finding God who's hidden right in front of us in plain sight. And how did he do that? Let me talk about, uh, he went large and then he went small in creation. And when he said, let there be light and the universe sprang into existence, he went large and hid himself in an ever expanding universe of 94 million light years across. I mean, when God split the atom and set the universe into motion, uh, the, the universe began to spin in every direction and to affinity at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. To this day, the universe is still going forward on the words of let there be light. And not only that, in this 94 million light years of universe is also uh, each uh, uh, galaxies, 100 billion galaxies. And in these galaxies, at least 100 billion stars and trillions of other objects, including uh, things like stellar matter and black holes and nuclear forces and supernovas and an infinite number of other anomalies throughout space. And this includes 99% of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is unseen by the human eye, such things as quantum particles and gamma rays and radio waves and x-rays and dark matter and antimatter and ultraviolet light. In summary, all these things are not seen. And less than 5% of the entire universe is invisible to the human eye and less than 1% of light in the spectrum of light is seen in the visible world. At our very best, we are flying blind. Why? Because God has hid himself in plain sight and there are places that God has hid himself that we will never find without living through eternities of eternities. So he has hidden himself in the largeness. He went big and hid himself in the largest of the universe. And we find God in the universe, but he also went small too, because he's the God of the biggest and he's the God of the smallest. He's in everything. He went small. All this vast enormity that he hid himself in, in the cosmos is an extension and is founded on the microscopic diversity of atoms, the minuscule little teeny atoms. God hid himself in the invisible to the human eye atom world, which plays a role in the underpinning and undergirding of all life and all matter on the earth. For example, the smallest speck of matter under a microscope is wide enough to contain 10 billion atoms. The smallest tiny speck of matter you can see under magnified thousands of times microscope contains 10 billion atoms and God lives there. God invested himself there. He went really small there. Even more baffling in this atom and this atom universe is the electron of each atom travels and an orbital speed and movement around the core of the nucleus and an unpredictable configurations, millions of trips each millionth of a second. Did you get that? The nucleus of these atoms has an electron orbit around it that travels billions of times each millionth of a second. And all this takes place in the speck of a matter, billions of times smaller than the thickness of human hair, and God is there. 
God hid himself. And if we could see under the microscope of all microscopes of all microscopes to get into the intricacies and to the weeds of this, we could see that God has hidden himself in plain sight. Although invisible to the human eyes, he is there. He went large and he went small. Why? Why did God do this? Why did God hide himself and create this great expression of the universe and this uh, world of atoms, this world of DNA, and, and this world of, of uh, intricacies, and, and this minuscule little microscopic world that everything is resting on. Why did who do that? Here's what I believe. And here's what I believe the Bible tells us. All of this was created as a starting place, as a cornerstone, as a foundation for his ultimate work of genius. He is a genius. He's a creator. And he created all this for what? For people and he ultimately his goal was not to just hide himself and invest himself in the universe and in the uh, atoms or the uh, atomic world but it was to reveal and to hide himself in people and people would be expression people like you and me the generation of mankind and he did that when he said let us make man in our image talking to the trinity he said now that we have it went big in the universe, we went small with the atom, and we have the plate set for man to be made from the particles of the earth. Now let us make Adam. And he makes Adam, and he hides himself. When he breathes into Adam's nostrils, he exhales his very existence into humanity, into jars of clay. He breathed into him, and our breath that is perpetuated from generation to generation to generation, the children's children of the children's children, the grandchildren's, every breath that is breathed. Matter of fact, everything that breathes on the earth is an expression of God's exhale. God exhales all through scripture, and I'll get to that in a minute. He only inhales at the very end, and we'll get to that. I mean, think about this, that God invested himself into humanity for thousands and thousands of millennia humanity after humanity, generation after generation, God invested himself by one breath into the nostrils of Adam's and Adam exhaled, inhaled into his lungs the very presence of God and the very person of God, the very profile of God. And in that breath of God, God hid himself in humanity. I know that it's hard to grasp because here's what I believe. People, humanity is God hidden in plain sight. I mean, that's hard to get because we're looking for God in all the wrong places. We're looking for God in the heavens. We're looking for God in deep revelation. We're looking for God everywhere except those made in his image and his likeness. He said, let us make men in our profile, in our images, in our likeness. And it is so brilliant. He's such a brilliant genius that to, to invest himself and to express himself and to invest himself into human beings at the same time hiding himself, his breath in us, so that although we are the manifest expression of who he is. We can't see it because people are God in disguise. People are Jesus in disguise because he's made us after his image and his likeness. So when he breathed into Adam's nostril, he exhaled. I mean, there's exhale and inhale cycles of God go through eternity of eternity. There's like, he will exhale in thousands of years before he inhales again. So he exhales, and matter of fact, this is what the Psalm says, every breath, our everything that breathes, our all the breath of God, is telling of His glory. So it is evident to me that whether it be insects, whether it be animals, whether it be you or me, everything that inhales and exhales that has breath is an expression of the hiddenness of God. God created the universe. He went big. He created atoms and He created the, the foundation uh, of, of, of creation out of small things. He went small, but He did that to put them together for you and me because he was homeless in a sense in a universe and he wanted to express himself in human beings. So people, you and me, are the express image of God. And every one of us has a breath of God in us that is unique from everybody else. There is no such thing in sameness as sameness theology in heaven. There is no such thing as God doing anything the same twice. No genius, no great artist repeats himself twice. Every human being is a distinct, unique expression of God, but all of us come from the exhale of God through the nostrils of Adam. Thousands of years later, uh, he hid his salvation, by the way, for the world because there was a fall after this exhale of God. And 
as you know, Adam and Eve fell. And there was need for salvation. So how did he bring salvation about? He hid himself in the breath of a little baby. And he exhaled himself and he expressed himself in the breath that was breathed upon Mary in the womb of Mary as he overshadowed her. Since the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you and shall breathe upon you and the thing that should be born unto you by be like the Son of God. So God hid his salvation in the scent of a little baby and the womb of a virgin. I mean, how brilliant is this? He hid himself in plain sight and nobody in his, the church of his day couldn't see it because they were looking for something mystical, something deep. The only people that could see it was three wise men and a few shepherds in the field. And today, I believe the only people that can see that God has hidden himself in generations of little babies. If you ever smelt the baby's head, you know what I'm talking about. Straight from the oven of heaven, babies are the beginning of God's expression and the beginning of God's exhale into creation. And that baby grows up and makes another baby and another baby. And so the family of God grows by the expression, the exhale of God in the Garden of Eden and also over Mary and the Gospels. And as a little baby, Jesus in the manger, in a cave, drew his first breath and exhaled his first breath, God was breathing again. And by the way, after Jesus was crucified on Calvary and Jesus exhaled his last breath, again, God hid himself in the salvation of the exhale of the last breath of Jesus when he said, it is finished, and he gave up his breath. Oh, I'm loving this, this is revelation. I don't know if it's getting there to you, but I'm just trying to say it with my heart and I can't seem to find the words, but I'm trying. He hid his eternal life in Calvary as he exhaled. It is finished. The First Testament church, or the first church of the New Testament rather, thought it was all over until the book of Acts. And they were in an upper room after the death of Jesus, thinking the church was gone, thinking things were over, maybe like you and me now, thinking everything is gone bad. What are we going to do? What's going to? And they were gathered together in one place, distraught, disillusioned, until God exhaled again to hide himself in the first New Testament church at the first century church. He exhaled and there came the sound of the breath of God. It's like God had been holding his breath since Malachi to the book of Matthew for over 400 years, God was silenced. He had been holding his breath and he exhales on the day of Pentecost. And when he does, there was a sound of life, the breath of God like the mighty rushing wind came into the first century church, which you and I are a product of the, the New Testament church. And he hides himself in the New Testament church. That's why he said, we should not forsake this summoning of ourselves together because we exhale and inhale the very life of God as we have communion with each other, as we communicate with this, with each other. Now, here's the part that's difficult to say. I don't know how to put words to this, but we are the expression of his breath. That's an exhale. When does God inhale? What do you mean, what happens here? Think of this, if God with an exhale created the universe and the atoms and humans and salvation and the New Testament church, everything that is and everything that has, everything that is not, and that is, is the byproduct of the exhale of God. What happens to stuff when God inhales? That means all the air that you breathe out comes back into you again. When God inhales, I believe that is the second coming. I believe our catching away, I believe the world folding up and going back into the very throne room of God, into the very heart of God, is the, the very tipping point for the second coming. It is God breathing back into his lungs everything that he expressed out. Wow. But, I'm going to finish with this. That is the second coming as an actuality of Jesus returning and the world being sucked up into heavens and the believer being taken away into heavens and, and the heavens and earth uh, with fervent fire melt away. And, and so everything vanishes except the very inhale of God as he inhales what he has exhaled over eternity. But what about you and me? Could there be many inhales? I mean, is God doing something right now? There's, it, I, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but is there like God hiccups or is God 
Is God trying to bring into, into place, into, into heaven, into his being something now? I mean, is God doing, yes, he is, I believe. I believe there's an inhale. I believe that God is among us. And I believe that God is with us. And we don't even know it. And he's starting to inhale us into his space. He's starting to inhale the church, inhale our essence. The breath that he gave us, he's taken back in the sense of we're being drawn into his glory, been drawn into his presence. Like Moses was at the burning uh, bush. And God said to him, take your shoes off here because you're standing on holy ground. Like Jacob, who was had a dream of going up and down on the ladder from heaven and angels ascending and descending. This was at a time when he had expressed and exhaled all that he knew to do. And God had exhaled into his life and, and he had this great prophetic word over his life, but he was running for his life because of uh, a trickery on his brother and because of things that went wrong. And when it looked like everything was done, God was inhaling and exhaling, angels coming and going, inhale, exhale, upon his life and he woke up like you and I are gonna wake up, hopefully this year, if not next year, if not, not long after that, we're gonna wake up like him and say, wow, surely God was in this place and I knew it not. Or we're gonna say like, or, or respond like Moses when God said, take your shoes off Moses, the place that you're standing is on holy ground. I believe that God has hidden himself in the moments of 2020 and the time and the space of 2020 where everything is shut down, where we're having to take a second look at everything, where everybody's activity is put to stop, where the ambition is curbed, where, where our wings have been clipped in a sense. Uh, we have been brought back to our right mind and hopefully our first love and return to our first response to God. We've realized that the air that we're breathing belongs to God. And that all things that are given go back to God, everything that God has put in us. He said he has set eternity in our hearts and he's gonna inhale eternity back into his place in his eternity. I believe we're on holy ground. And I just want to say this to you, get ready for a heart encounter with God that will be, un it's it, it just unspeakable. Hey look, real friends find silence not uncomfortable. Real friends that get close learn silence is not an uncomfortable thing. We're really uncomfortable now because we've not known God and we're not confident in what God is doing. We're not confident that God is in 2020, that God is in this place in the world, that God is in the church, God is in, uh, God is in uh, the world, He's in the political system, He's in the business, he, he, He's everywhere. God fills every atom, every space, every quantum particle. God is in it right now. He's here and we don't even know it. Like Jacob said, God is in this place and man, I have goosebumps. I didn't know it, I didn't realize it. I'm telling you, We've been looking for God in all the wrong places. And by the way, we're not late to our destiny. We're early to the scene of our destiny. This is not something that's caught God by surprise. This is something that was planned out billions of years ago. God knew the day they were in now, and God knew what it would take to bring us to a place that we could say, no matter what's going on, God has hidden himself in this time and in me, and God is about to inhale everything he's exhaled into our lives. He's about to bring the church back into his heart as he inhales us into his very presence, into his being. And this is gonna be one of the greatest, greatest hiddenness, revealing, inhaling, exhaling, revival, renaissance, whatever you want to call it. It's just gonna be something that no word will capture. God is doing something small, something big, something hidden, and something revealed. He's God, that's what he does. You and I just need to know in closing that no matter what it looks like, no matter where you're at, the place you're standing is holy ground. Moses had spent 40 years as a failure and he stood at a place where God said, the place you're standing, I don't care where you're standing, I don't care who you are, what's going on in your life, God's there with you and the place that you're in, it's holy ground. No matter how bad it's going for you, it's holy ground because God is in the bush. God is speaking to you and he's about to bring you to your place of destiny. You're not late, you're early. God's a good timekeeper and he don't make late. He always does early well. And so don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. The scripture says, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. God will 
make His ways and acts and works to be expressed in our life. Don't panic, get a life, get a breath and breathe. For let everything that hath breath praise the Lord in 2020. Father, I thank you. You are amazing. I feel so foolish trying to capture who you are in mere human language. How trite, how, how dumb, how, how impossible it is. You're so big, yet you're so small you fit in a quantum particle, in a nucleus of an atom. You're everywhere. You're in our space, you're in our place, you're in our lives, and we don't even know it. This time that we're going through, you brought us to because you're detoxing us from the spirit of religion. You're detoxing us from ambition. You're detoxing us from the blindness that covers this world and from the gross darkness and the blindness of this age. You're detoxing us from performance mentality. And you're saying to us, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends because friends know each other. Servants perform. Friends have conversations and fellowship. Lord, thank you for the fellowship of the Spirit. And thank you for that breath of God, that inhale, exhale. Split the atom as you did the atom in creation, as you did the second atom on Calvary and the first atom in the garden. Lord, split the atom again and cause us to express and expand at the speed of light into the very heart, the nature of God, and make us understand what Paul said, that we're being transformed into his image from glory to glory to glory. Linear at 186,000 miles per second for God is light. We are being transformed into his image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Lord, thank you for your gracious, creative genius. Help us not to panic, but to praise you and let everything in the earth say, God sits upon the heavens and rules and reigns, and nothing is left untouched and uncovered by His hands. Thank you, Lord. Amen.